I'm just going to start recording. Um, okay, we are dialing in the visuals. And I noticed yesterday that the uh, audio levels of the piano were a little low. That's the first mistake. So that's why I'm going to stop at the first mistake. And oh, each time the thing to, will get longer. I was just about to do a welcome to being in the world. Fade, that's a, faded. That's what I was, I was going to say yeah, that um, yeah, let's do we it. could come up with like a little introduction let's, that, let's that, try it again. that we it again. write. You have an, an idea for what you might want to say? Well, I'm going to start basic. Just welcome to being in the world. Okay, let's try that again. But I'll, I'll put up my Leonard Cohen voice. <clears throat> That's I, it? <laughs> I didn't time it perfectly. Also, I think my levels are really low. I can't even hear myself. Uh oh. Okay, hold on. Wait, you seem fine on this, but let me let me check you out here. How about now? Uh yeah. Yeah. How's that? Better. Hi everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the, the second day of the second season. Welcome to our dress rehearsal. Yeah. As as they all are. And and I love that. And I think that again, the best advice we got. On when we asked for advice was don't follow any advice. So I'm going to take that advice, paradoxically. Yeah, there's an old go proverb, which is never follow proverbs. Oh, really? There's always some meta twisted, like girdles incompleteness proverb. <clears throat> or a bit of advice, you know, the one that yeah. self cancels. I think your levels are low because your mic is a little far away from your face. You should just move it a little towards you. Like just swing it towards you. There you go. Yeah. All right. So it's now, uh, it's, wow, it's 11.11 on November 11th right now, p.m. One, 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 one. Make a wish, everyone. Yeah. I can't believe we stayed up this late. <laughs> um, I love our studio also, which doesn't actually give any uh, hint of what's going on outside. Yeah, it's no. Just, it's getting so beautiful and wintry out there. People don't realize the desert gets cold. It, it snows. Does the, there's snow-capped peaks outside your window. It's glorious. Yeah. Last, like I, I went for a little walk, and it looked like I was in a Swiss postcard. Yeah. It was really lovely. Last year, uh, we had our first winter, like our snow since the pool was built, and we sat in the in the hot tub with like eight inches of snow all around us, like and these Joshua trees, you know, spikes uh, under the snow. It's very unexpectedly surreal and beautiful how do you like living in the desert so far what's what's been your experience of it i am most so i, I often live vicariously through other people's points of view and so the thing that i realized that i most liked about the desert is that people show up here and they they can see the horizon and the horizon looks like something they can walk to and and i think when when people are coming from urban environments that's just something that can is never true and and it looks almost i don't know I, I grew up with an ocean all around me on all sides i mean i guess there was land on one side on the other side of the ocean but mostly just ocean and so i i didn't realize how much i depended on being able to walk to the edge of a property or like walk to the edge of a geographic borderline and just stand there and look out and not be able to go further and i feel like the desert has a kind of oceanic quality to it which is like if I stand at the top of this hill, it's just BLM land forever. And I mean, yeah, I guess I could walk that way in the same way that I could hypothetically swim just like straight out into the ocean, but I know I would die. Um, I feel very similar when I'm looking out at a kind of desert landscape as I do an oceanic landscape. Someone, someone, we said something about BLM land to someone the other day and they said, Black Lives Matter land? Oh, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> it's actually Bureau of Land Management, but I think we could, we could just yeah. christen it Black Lives Matter. Federal, federal land. Yeah, the opposite of the BLM movement. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, so what else has been on your mind these days? What are you thinking about, Patrick? Mm, I've been thinking about like oh, it's kind of it's kind of boring and personal, like optimizing different time scales and not knowing how to do that. What do you mean by optimizing time scales? Like the 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 degree to which. So, I very much think the pandemic 
uh, shrunk people's people's like time horizons with which they planned. Like planning became impossible, which made people kind of prioritize the day, if not the week, and it also prioritized like survival in an almost kind of like emergency, almost poverty kind of way. And like now that it's coming back, I find myself trying to think about what to do weeks, months, hence. Like 2021 is now a realistic possibility of a year that exists. Whereas much of this year, I felt like we were just kind of trying to focus on and get through 2020. Mm -hmm. Like we just didn't know what would happen. Were there positive sides to that though? Um, I mean, I think there's extremely addictive qualities to emergency kinds of thinking. Mm -hmm. So, so there's this funny thing. Um, what were the exact two examples? Yeah. Uh, I was camping with someone and I was in a kind of anxious state and uh, for whatever reason, I was just like, my mind was elsewhere. My mind was just kind of like on a loop and I wasn't very, even though I was out in nature and it was by virtue of the very fact that I was out in nature with someone I really liked and we were together and it was romantic and we were camping out in the woods and it was the first time we'd camped and it was stunningly beautiful, like Mount Rainier in Washington. It was gorgeous. It was one of her favorite spots. It was this little thing right by the, by the water, this secluded little campsite. And the whole time I was just anxious and the whole time I was just thinking like, I by virtue of the anxiety, do like do not deserve to be here. Don't at some threshold want to be here anymore. Um, I felt underprepared. I like didn't have the right kind of, you know, I've, I've always felt somewhat like I always have the wrong equipment for the environment that I'm in. And sometimes just my body is that equipment that is wrong for the environment that I'm in. And I ended up um, being so, so, so cold. I had to actually sleep in like a, uh, I was, I was so, kind of highly allergic to the animal that she had. And was it a cat on a camping trip? No, it was a, a, a dog that lived with a cat. And so the dog had a bunch of cat hair and danger. They like I always see. curled up together. And so I couldn't actually sleep in the tent. Right. And so here I am being like, just what the fuck immune system? What the fuck? Like body, you're like dragging this, like you, you can't handle any of these things. And my knife was dull. And like, it, I just like was not prepared for Rainier winter weather. And like, and there were, there were little uh, hints of bears around and I, I don't even think it's black bears there. I think it's like actual bears. And so there's this moment I'm sleeping off in this like side tent, like alone and shivering, allergic in a way and anxious from this, uh, from my, from my girlfriend at the time. And, uh, just kind of like, like, like unable to sleep because of all these thoughts of just kind of like, why am I here? Why can't I optimize? Like, oh, I wish I, you know knew how to use a knife, kind of like, I don't even know how to start a fire. And then I hear a bear sniffing outside my tent. Oh my God. Just right outside my tent. And immediately all the thoughts which had existed and percolated in my brain for six hours unstopped and would not go away, just evaporated, right? Because all I had to do was fix the bear problem now. Right. All I had to do was get past like literally like all the worries were about this kind of like optimization problem of, well, why aren't I a better person out in nature? Like, who am I? You know, like, why can't I be a better partner? All this bullshit that wasn't about surviving. It was about the time horizon of like days to months to years. Right. Or a lifetime. And but once this bear was outside, everything went away and it was so crystal clear that all I had to do. And so I grabbed my knife as if that would help. It would, wouldn't it? Uh, it gave me at least the confidence to think I could go outside. I don't know. I didn't know what to do. And of course I knew, and it felt like it was between our tents. Right. And then my immediate concern was her and the dog and all these things. And, um, so I get my knife and I like go, I kind of wait a little while and was sniffing around and kind of, um, uh, after, after a few minutes, I kind of go outside. I, I yell, uh, uh, her name and, it wasn't a bear. It was just a stupid dog. There was no yeah, bear. Yeah, no, no, no. It was just a, I had misperceived the sniffing. <laughs> so anticlimactic. So she had, she had got out to take like star. I was so worried. I know. She had got outside like out of the tent and I just didn't hear it to take like astral photography at night, like long exposure stuff. And of course brought her dog and the dog came back because it missed me. And it was sniffing around and I had misperceived the size of the sniffing. <laughs> and, but it was, it, what was so interesting was how quickly and like, like no other thing could 
kind of stop my thoughts from kind of rolling. Except that, right, emergency came in and interrupted mm -hmm. and gave me clarity in a way that nothing else could. And so I feel like the pandemic for a lot of people has actually achieved that on some small level. They've had anxiety about their life or how do you optimize, how to be in the world, how do we make our own lives, you know, uh, 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 for ourselves to the best and maximal degree possible. But then an emergency comes and you just have to survive the day. You just have a, you have a, I mean, you have a tiny virus bear outside your tent, right? And suddenly all these thoughts go away. You just, what do you do? You just need to make sure that your family survives. You know, you need to check in with your parents or you check in with your loved ones and you find the friends that matter to you. And so I think there's a, there is a benefit to that kind of occasional dipping a toe into emergency yeah. to make you realize like what's, what's truly and really important. And so those are the kind of time, when I say time scales and thinking about optimizing on time scales, what I'm realizing internally right now in mid November, 2020 is that I've started thinking again about months and years and optimization into the future. Because you see an end in sight, even though, cause you sent me an article yesterday that, um, things are going to get worse before they get better. It seems right. We're, we're entering a dark winter. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, Daniel Griffin, this, uh, New York, I think he's an infectious disease doctor, um, or specialist, definitely a doctor. Uh, he kind of gives the guiding speeches. Doctors who get COVID end up calling him and being mm -hmm. like, what should I do? Mm -hmm. Kind of thing. He guides and advises other doctors about how to deal with this. And he says we're in for the darkest winter we've ever seen. Just this coming each, winter. Each one of us, we have a high probability of living the darkest time that anyone yeah. has ever lived. Yeah. I mean, the, or that in modern times or something. Yeah. And I think he probably means for like modern Western times. I'm sure yeah. like Ukraine in the nineties during, you know, revolution was a bit tough. Yeah. Or Syria. Or the like last many. Years. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, 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 but like up there in, in, in darkness and death basically. Yeah. And, and just, uh, I, 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 the way that I interpreted what he said, given all the context in which he said that exact statement was that, it's also the case that people are going to be anxious as all hell because the flu symptoms mimic the Corona symptoms. Right. So hospitals will get overloaded with kind of false positives. People will get really anxious. People will be taking two week off quarantines all the time. People get fired, you know, stop working. It's happened on the compound already twice with you and David both getting sick with a bunch of symptoms that seemed like Corona and then luckily yeah. weren't. Right? Yeah, I had a sore throat for a couple of days. Yeah, my thought after yesterday's episode was that we, um, we may have been a little premature in our rosy outlook, um, especially looking at the news. You know, it's so it was we were so exuberant about Biden's win. And now I'm seeing more and more hints that, you know, Trump may go full authoritarian. Um, you know, he's firing all of his, uh, you know, he's firing anyone who appears not to be a loyalist. He's trying to install people in a secretary of defense of, uh, you know, who might cater to his wild idea of just not leaving. Right. And, um, you know, the news media luckily is not going along. Other world leaders don't seem to be going along. But if it seems between like the worsening numbers of COVID and, you know, a wannabe dictator who has no shame about sucking up to dictators and wanting to be one himself and has no respect for the, you know, our norms or our democratic institutions, um, shit's going to get weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, and the authoritarian recipe is to have an emergency. Yeah. Uh, you so know, whether, whether it has to be a, created even a misperceived bear outside your tent you know the virus can easily be turned into a story of oh actually mandatory federal shutdown nobody can go outside you know do it's, it's quite it's quite easy to imagine that there is now a ready-made almost like easy bake oven emergency to declare if it if an authoritarian kind of an aspirational authoritarian needs an emergency there's a global pandemic, <laughs> yep. you know, and, 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 and politically Trump has been kind of avoiding, uh, uh, embracing the pandemic for all kinds of like personal liberty reasons or whatever the hell his base needs, but it's ready and waiting for them. I'm sure there's so many emergency kind of powers that can be called upon for yeah, the president I, in this kind of situation. I'm very concerned. And there's this, there's this irrational exuberance, even in the stock market's hitting record highs. Meanwhile, Italy's shutting down again. Um, Every, I don't know. There's this. We feel like we're on this, like this. We're up on this high peak on this precipice. You know, like if you look at the stock market chart, if you look at like the the, the optimism that we felt even yesterday, it feels like we're up high on this mountain, but on the edge of a cliff that would be very easy to fall off of right now. 
And I'm very curious what the next two months are going to look like. I think you, you talked about wanting to, you know, batten down the hatches a bit, be a little more careful because we've let down our guard quite a bit, seeing other people. And, yeah. you know, we, I, I've, I've noticed how easy it is to get swept up in the mood of the group, right? Like Absolutely. Well, our, our individual like ideas about this have very little influence in our behavior, it seems. Well, it's shocking how like adults can still be enabled. <laughs> like it just keeps happening over and over like like because we're we're smiley and happy and it's like come welcome to the desert oasis and you know you can go back and read like mask of the red death by edgar Allan poe and it's the same thing plague pandemic people go to a party and you f you kind of forget and let loose a little bit because in part i think the emergency thinking makes you so your threshold so different for like like r what what counts as the kind of like relaxing joy and where to find pleasure in life and in the small stuff and it's like i've w one of the kind of counterpoints to this we've been a little loose is i've seen a lot of people come here and and kind of like rest in in your hot tub with the gorgeous desert horizon and people that are kind of if not close but at least just relaxed and many many people have said you know this is the first time they've been outside in six months Mm -hmm. And this was their joy. And you see the like fatigue just like fall off them. Yeah. Like, you know, like, like I've also old met leaves. People, I've met people who have also said they hadn't socialized in. That's, that's in what I mean. Months. Like they hadn't talked to a person live in months. When I yeah. first got here, I hadn't really like I did on a road trip down. I saw a friend or two. But like this was my first when I kind of drove up here. It was yeah. the first time I'd really spoken to someone. And so that that I mean, honestly, like the degree to which, yes, We've been a little loose with opening up and you know the desert doesn't have that many cases and the air is different and the density is different out here and we're outside most of the time and we're outside almost all the time um and we're very careful about who gets let in and that kind of thing but like the other side of that is you have provided immense stress relief <laughs> for people here uh like like the the people that have come and said hi and i you've i've seen it i've seen just like the like the first breath that they've taken in six or seven months of just joy and it's not quite joy yet but it's utter relaxation and it's like medicinal for me this speaks to like a, a, a fundamental conflict i have in myself about like my view of nature um i've you know they say like if you take a psychedelic you should sit in nature because it's so beautiful and magnificent and everything right and i've done that a couple of times and my one of my first thoughts is this nature would kill me so quickly <laughs> if i really were like you know in it right and 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 the whether there's this amazing film that i highly recommend um about the making of fitz Caraldo, the Werner herzog oh, film yeah. burden of dreams burden of dreams that's a great movie and um les blank was a berkeley hippie documentary filmmaker fantastic filmmaker a lot of people think burden of dreams is better than the movie that it's I'm you know ostensibly <laughs> about the making of um which is Fitzgerald which is a, a Herzog film that's also worth watching but maybe not his best um but Burden of Dreams is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen and there's this moment Herzog was the the film is about dragging a ship over a mountain this wild dreamer played by Klaus Kinski wants to bring opera to the you know jungle of Iquitos in Peru in the Andes and uh he finds this this piece of river that could be really great to own and and get rubber from there's he's a you know a, he's a, a aspiring rubber baron and um but in order to like take advantage of the land you, you, he'd have to bring a ship over to this tributary of river but um the only way to do this is to drag a ship over a mountain a low mountain pass and so Herzog, being the wild dreamer that he is decided that the only way to make this film would be to really drag a ship over a mountain and you know, all hell ensued with like having to start over after two years of filming because one of the stars got sick and and people actually, I think a couple of people died with the when the ship slipped back down the mountain. Yeah, yeah. It was an absolute nightmare. And um, and 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 Herzog, you know, said that if he has to keep going or he'd be a man without dreams. Right. Mm -hmm. This was like his <clears throat> the theme of the of the documentary. And there's this really memorable moment, which if you don't feel like watching the whole film, you know, you can just watch this clip on uh, on uh, on YouTube if you type in Werner Herzog jungle. 
and um, he is talks about people's like misguidedly romantic view of nature, and he says, you know, people think of nature as harmonious and peaceful, and he says, no, it's nothing but murder, collective murder, and chaos and fornication and and he says in the birds they don't sing they screech in pain and you look up at the stars and they're a big mess and we have to get acquainted with this this you know the nature of nature being fundamentally violent and base and he says then we even even in our at our worst we are nothing but badly written you know sentences of a cheap airport novel compared to the collective like murder and like almost you know just systematic chaos of nature and i when i experienced anxiety attacks a lot like recurringly as in my early 20s i always thought like okay now i'm seeing nature and life for what it actually is right which is not at all hostile to to human or either hostile or indifferent to anything we care about. And, um, th you know, this, what you're telling me about the pandemic uh, mixed with, you know, the, the feeling of relaxation that people have in this pretty brutal, you know, environment up here, harsh desert environment. Every, you know, when I had a neighbor once who was very grumpy and, and somebody made me more empathetic to them by saying that people start to resemble their, their, their surroundings after a long time and since everything around here is prickly i should understand that people are going to be prickly too and these joshua trees are so cool and surreal and beautiful but if you touch them it'll go through your hand yeah, yeah easily yeah. right well i'm trying to think of just in any direction the ability to walk i mean you can't walk in a straight line anywhere there's not a single thing out here that wants your attention right like it is defensive and and violent like it will rip you up and you can't walk very far there's no like, you know, it's not friendly out here. No. Like, you're friendly. <laughs> the thing you've built is friendly, but it is so unfriendly. But is it, yeah, <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it an illusion? Is it, is it a, uh, an illusory veneer that we've created? I mean, every summer, you know, a few people die in the park because they don't realize that you need, it's easy to get lost. It's millions of acres. Uh, it gets really hot. It, you don't have long out there if you, if, you, if you don't, without water and in that direct sunlight, even without an animal coming to eat you, yeah, you're dead. There was a there was a, a young couple died last summer or two summers ago, and they were like they found them like you know that famous image of like the the two early humans that are like oh, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that like died holding each other face to face yeah it was like that they were found like that and it and it got really dark because it turns out they had a gun and after a week out there they had like he had like killed her and himself because out of pure despair mm -hmm. um so so yeah i mean it's like we look at this we look at the stars we look at the the nature around us we we uh we like to think there's this deep harmony and yet you know between this virus and our helplessness in front of it in front of you know the cold the heat these the the, the bear if it had been a bear whether your little knife would have helped you or not do you yeah. do you think about that <laughs> I mean, no, I would have, I, I mean, I, it, I've seen enough of the like YouTube videos of bears running 30 miles an hour and climbing up trees and just like completely mauling the hell out of cameras that are left out and other things. I mean, there's no chance in hell, right? I've, I've seen oh, the Revenant three times. I know. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess the, you know, do we, do we stand a chance against nature? That's, that's what I'm, uh. I'm wondering, and our own nature, which also is can be really dark. And so what I really respect about the titles of some of these kind of biology-based um, things I listen to, um, uh, podcasts I listen to, it's one, there's one, there's, there are groups uh, like Parasites Without Borders and Viruses Without Borders and Doctors Without Borders. And uh, it's just, it, 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 it seems so simple and so obvious, but it's such a clear and stark a necessary reminder that these things don't give a shit about our human constructs that all of this this natural biology is not concerned with borders or border crossing right yeah. you know it's viruses without borders and we for some reason we're comparing like country tallies and all this shit like oh the u.s has x amount of cases and i get it we do have these physical borders that operate kind of almost as if they're natural borders as if it's a river separating you know a wall is kind of like a natural river it is a natural divide that will keep like species of mice on 
or butterfly on either side of it. Well, no, it's not a butterfly. But, like, it's so weird to me that the way that we are talking about this as a globe, as a collection of 8 billion people, is country by country statistics. That's so human and so wrong. <laughs> because the way yeah. to be talking about this is pools of demographics across countries, pools of 18 to 30 year olds, or like what what blood types, or, you know, we need, we like, more so than ever, we need to categorize and clump and cluster, not based on country or race, but based on kind of like biological dispositions. And we're just not doing it because we're just so in, enamored by our own like un, uh, idea that this is kind of like a war and we should treat it like a war as if territories matter. But it's not. It's viruses without borders. It's parasites without borders. They don't. They don't care. It, there's a word in uh, in Italian. I think it's campanilismo, which is campana is the bell of the of the town, and so campanilism would be like bellism, and it just means concern only for what's going on within the borders within of your the little town, oh, yeah, right? right, right. Um, it's a, it's even small, because you know we talk about patriotism, but yeah. Italy wasn't even a country until the 1860s. Before that, you just had these really small in in the town where I grew up. In Vignanello, about an hour north of Rome, like there's a different accent in the town that's literally across the street. Like you cross the street to another town, and and I, the kids would say, "Oh yeah, my the town, the other town is called Vallerano," and the kids would say, "I'm half Valeranese yeah. and half Vignanellese." And what what separated it? A road, a canal, road. or just, just a road? road. Yeah. yeah. You could literally walk across and they'd say like my mom's from there my dad's from here and they'd have like as if you were like half chinese and half the, you know uh, right, right. <laughs> peruvian or something and and they have different ways even the different like indefinite article and stuff would be like pronounced in a different way in the two towns and and you realize how separate they they were you know i remember an old housekeeper that came from a nearby village she said oh my pasta is famous it, uh, it's been halfway around the world, like to, to Rome, to Viterbo, which is the like, <laughs> next town over. That was half the world for right, her, of course, right? Of course. So it's natural, I think, that we have this. Uh, but but, but my, my question is, there, there is a certain degree to which are the walls against, you know, that we put up against nature are obviously helpful. When I've had these psychedelic experiences in the middle of nature, I, I, I then reflect on the safety of my home and the ability to get food at the grocery store and all of these things. And of course, all of that can fall apart, but we do erect boundaries and including the masks that we're wearing and, you know, and not letting people in our homes and all of this stuff. There's a, there's a necessary uh, putting up of barriers to protect us in a meaningful way, right? That we have to protect ourselves from the virus. And one way to do that is to avoid travel too much, avoid, uh, you know, contact with too many strangers and... And call the minks. Calling all the minks. Yeah, this is crazy. Like, in, uh, for those of you who haven't heard, like they're killing... Culling seems like a unnecessarily uh, obscure and nice word. Why not just say kill? Why, thank you. <laughs> no, they, all the articles I'm, say culling it's like as if like like i mean if 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 literally the subtitle to the to my tombstone i guess my tombstone has a subtitle now um, <laughs> is unnecessarily obscure but nice <laughs> ha happy if every single one of my utterances could achieve such critical acclaim so they, they are killing 15 million minks in denmark all of the minks of denmark which are i guess it still has a thriving mink industry which is, was surprising to me i didn't know this i guess a lot of people still buying mink goats and stuff or are they maybe maybe in asia Probably or something somewhere um but anyway the, it seems that the uh, the virus has passed on to the minks it can mutate Talk, tell us about virus reservoirs uh yeah well so that's extremely common in parasites and viruses to have an animal reservoir which is like it it jump a lot of these things swine flu avian flu there's they're called that partly because they have an animal host where the thing either mutates or isn't as pathogenic so like if it gets into swine it doesn't really kill them but the virus will kind of sit in them as a petri dish and will replicate and then jump back yeah, if either mutating or not mutating uh jump maybe like the seasons pass but it sits in the pig as an animal reservoir it's called and then jumps back into human when the season's ready again and this happens for a lot of different things i mean the rat was not the carrier of the plague it was a animal reservoir for the fleas which then carried it to humans right 
So the, the rat was the reservoir. The rats are reservoirs for a lot of different diseases. And they carry them, but they don't usually give them to us, but they are necessary in, or like they're necessary in keeping a virus or parasite kind of within a population and close to people. So often you'll see culling of a lot of livestock or animal herds. If there's a tiny bit of virus or parasite or pathogen detected in them, simply because it's so hard to eliminate. And the reservoirs can have all kinds of unintended consequences because if they're intermediate hosts, which means they're not like the definitive hosts, it just kind of sits in them and, it, and it's harmless and it can last for centuries in like, wow. like well, cause I mean, livestock breeding, you keep the stock and you keep it going. And so these things, if they're kind of harmless, they'll last for centuries and jump back and forth into people and mutate like mad. So, so it often happens with uh, like Lyme disease, I believe, on the kind of northeast coast. The attempt, and, and you'll see this sometimes with malaria, the attempt is not necessarily to attack the parasite in the uh, immediate host vector. It's to get rid of the animal reservoirs. I, I had a back back to the, uh, the 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 harshness of nature, which I, this is just yet another example of it. I think. I, I, and and back to the the psychedelic experience. I had a, a an LSD trip once, uh, and my friend Mark Rathall, who I'm excited to hopefully have on the podcast several episodes over Christmas, he might come out here. Great. Um, but he said, you know, he asked me to describe it, and I said, you know, I just had this overwhelming feeling that life is hard for everything, for every animal for the plants for the and that we're we're all struggling to survive and that it's and and that you know we should always be as compassionate as possible because life is so hard for for everything and he said oh you had a a schopenhauerian lsd trip and that that was the essence of schopenhauer's pessimism Mm -hmm. right that everything is struggling everything is just fighting to uh to live and it's you know it's a very kind of Darwinian view as well, I guess. I mean, we're, the the things that we call wars pale in comparison to what's happening between there. There's one continuous war on this planet, and it is never ending. And the casualties we wouldn't even have like enough ink to write the significant digits. Uh, it's like bacteria and viruses have been fighting and killing each other for billions of years. Uh, in like the oceans. So if you look at the amount of viruses that are on the planet, there's trillions of them. Really? Individual kinds of virus. Oh, and they fight against bacteria? Yeah. Most of them are bacteriophages, which which kill specific species of bacteria. And it's usually like one-to-one. It's like a targeted precision assassination. And this is happening in the in the jet streams, in the air, in the oceans. And, you know, if you pick up like a a cup of ocean water, there's millions of viruses in there. And there's like... Specifically, they don't give a, They don't care about mammals. They don't care how special we think we are, how conscious we are, whether or not we feel pain or sadness. They're just there to spread and attack bacteria. So, like, wow. it is brutal. If you if you had a if you had the ability to zoom in on what nature truly is, you would find like a massacre, to, like out of out of even human comprehension. Yeah, um, I was. I referenced this yesterday. The uh, uh, Alex Filipenko, the uh, Berkeley astronomer, gave a great interview with uh, with Lex Friedman the other day, which I highly recommend everybody look up on the Artificial Intelligence podcast. And they were discussing the Fermi par- paradox, which, for those of you who don't know, is like, uh, you know, if there's life, te- if the, if the galaxy is teeming with life, like where is everybody? Why haven't we seen anybody? Right? And then there's different solutions proposed. One is that you know, may- maybe there isn't any other life out there and maybe or maybe just so much of space is <coughs> empty um but one one uh solution that filipenko suggested that i hadn't heard which is that you know maybe the universe is teeming with life but intelligence is an aberration because it's actually not that useful um and if we just look at at how much life there is on earth and how little of it basically one yeah. has consciousness and is able to make things that we're so impressed with ourselves for making you know cities and machines and 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 language and all of this but maybe it's not that adaptive right like maybe there's a lot of better ways to 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 uh get uh and so so that you know if you see out of trillions you say of like viruses bacteria and other species that, that exist on earth only one happens to have what we have 
maybe you know out of the trillions that exist out there it's all like that it's all microbial it's all bacterial or you know analogous to that yeah absolutely i i find um to the to the point of the fermi paradox there's this one constellation which is my favorite the boots b-o-o-t-e-s and what the reason i like it is there's this phenomenon called the boots void which is if you look out into space and like zoom in far enough there's like a there's a distribution of the amount of stars or galaxies you'll find in any given like random patch. If you like randomly spin your telescope and end up somewhere, you should expect to see, you know, X amount of galaxies within a distribution of anywhere, any compared to any other patch of sky, except for this one spot, which has way too few. There's just like anomal anomalously few galaxies and it's called the boots void because there's just nothing there and no one knows why there's nothing there. And I love the idea that, you know, Fermi's attempts and so many people have attempted to try to find the marks and measures of the positive presence of life. Like life has left a legacy or life has sent a radio signal or we've wrapped a star in a kind of sphere, Dyson sphere, which collects all the energy in which we should be able to see hints or traces of. But I like the idea that instead life leaves a absence. So like the boots void is actually an indicator of, I don't know, like an, an, uh, some intelligence that got large enough that it realized that the only way to send a signal out to the rest of the universe is not to flash something, but to be an absence of something. Well, wow, and they self-destructed for this reason? Yeah, or? like they pushed pause. So I wrote a short story about this, uh, like a sci-fi short story about this, where some some AI of sufficient intelligence at some point gains con enough control over kind of like particulate, uh, you know, basically control over determinism, you know, control over how all the things move. And it decides that, right, and, and this happens over and over and over, right before a society or civilization self-destructs, it decides to push the pause button on everything. And so the boots void is a consequence of that, that section of the universe pushing the pause button. And they're just waiting. Like that. They're waiting for someone to come and kind of save them. Very nice. Okay, so uh, maybe we should just end on that, on the nothing. <laughs> the it's a really dark episode. Forgive us. <laughs> I guess there's a darkness Ooh. in the air. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not great news that we're, the virus is sweeping through our country still yet again. I mean, yes, there's 138,000 cases, I think. Right. Oh, boy. Okay, so let's keep our fingers collectively crossed and hope that, that the next couple of months, as, as we get, as, as uh, us, at least in, in the Northern Hemisphere, we're going to get colder. It's going to get darker. And there's, there's, a, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and and but the tunnel is long and dark right now so yeah. let's let's hope that we get through it and we're going to cough and we're going to get fevers but it's mostly going to be okay but exactly we need to not not worry too much don't panic and see you tomorrow goodbye